All right, welcome back to the tour breakaway. We just finished up the tour of the Basque country and it absolutely delivered. With some other racing going on this week, I would definitely want to do a quick recap on Shelter Priest because the usual masterclass that's put on by Jacoyna Quick Step was anything but. So I want to do a quick, quick bit on that. And then we're meant to look forward to the tour of Turkey, which was meant to start tomorrow, and the return of Fabio Jacobson. Of Unfortunately, that's been canceled, but we'll take a quick peek at what that is. But Tour of the Basque Country, uh, absolutely fantastic race. The first showdown of the Rog and Pog show, exactly what we expect to be the, the headline of the Tour de France this year. And we've seen them both looking fantastic to date, but we haven't seen them go head to head. And so this is our first opportunity to see that. And basically, all the general classification big guns were out in the Basque Country. We had Ineos with Carapaz, Adam Yates, Gegenhart, if he's a big if he's a big gun, I don't know, reigning Giro champion, but more to come on that. Movistar sending Enric Moss, but more importantly, Alejandro Valverde, the ageless wonder, uh, coming off his win at the Miguel Indurain uh, GP. Just, you know, turning back the clocks. First win since the 2019 Vuelta, and it's not even a notch in his belt to come in with a, with a win this year. That's nothing on his Palmares, but... Just keeping the dream alive for all the senior citizens out there, and we absolutely love it. So, a uh, quick run-through of the main outcomes of the stages, because the way this race evolved was really interesting. It all started on uh, day one with a 13.9-kilometer time trial, and, you know, you got to like when those start, you really see, well, who's got what form, um, and how's that going to play out, followed by four hilly days, and then the finale, which we just had today, featuring six categorized climbs three cat ones in there uh including the the final of the day so as i said day one 13.9 kilometer time trial a bit tricky um in in terms of technicality and then a little kicker at the end the result roglic took the day he was out on the course super early and he sat in the hot seat for hours if you saw the pictures from earlier in the week he just looked bored he was sitting there he's like who are all these mere mortals that are trying to up, upend my time. It will not happen. It will not be done. And it wasn't. Uh, he did get one good scare from Brandon McNulty, uh, American UAE rider who came within two seconds uh, of him. And he, so he finished just two seconds back. I believe he had a, a lead on Roglic actually at one of the time checks. Um, and it was a good show by Jumbo Visma overall. I mean, aside from Roglic winning, uh, Jonas Vingegaard came in third, 18 seconds back, and Tobias Foss fourth at 24 seconds back. So that's great work. Great work by Vingegaard, or Vingegu is, I, I think, the pronunciation. Uh, but he's already got a stage win at the UAE Tour on the sec, you know, between one of the two most notable climbs, Yebel Yes, um, which is fantastic. And then he had the overall win and two stage wins at uh, Kopi Abertali. So that 24-year-old is looking like one of the great, well, what's going to be domestiques, uh, for the year, but a lot of promise looking at him. Now, there were a couple of folks that didn't perform particularly well in the time trial, and most notably was Tade Pogaccia, and he and Yates were both 28 seconds back. You could say that's about on par for what we'd expect from Yates usually, but he did have a really good time trial at Volta Catalunya where he just like decimated the whole race. Um, although in that race, he was able to stay within seven seconds of McNulty. Now, here, uh, he was... 26 seconds behind McNulty. So actually, on a relative basis from what we've seen so far this year, not a great day for Yates, um, but probably more on par with what we typically expect from him. But Pogaccia, that's somebody that we would expect to be on about equal terms with the leaders. We would expect him to be top three. Um, I mean, to lose anything more than probably 10 seconds, I think, in this case, would be a bit of a surprise. And it was. So for him, 20, 28 seconds back, it was kind of like, huh. You know, is something up with Pog? Um, legitimate question. We've just never seen him miss. Like, he just doesn't have bad days. So, you know, interesting to see what would come of that. Now, uh, stage two, uh, we'll just get right to it. Alex Ant Aramburu took a win for Astana, launching a late attack. Nobody responded. Not a big GC shakeup on that day, aside from what would temporarily be a move up of Aramburu into second overall. First, you know, He's in his first year on the World Tour, and he's looking solid, Aaron Buru is. Um, you know, previously at a, a Conti team, first year now in Astana. He was sixth at Omlupet Newsblot, and two years in a row, seventh at Milan San Remo. So watch this guy. He's 25, but you know, first year in the World Tour, and um, 
you know, he's, he's making some noise. So love to see it. Now, stage three, we get back to the fun hilltop finish and you know who we're going to see there. So we'll basically just fast forward to the action. We were in the last kilometers. The, the decisive attack came from Pogacar with a, with a kilometer and a half to go. Roglic, of course, went with him. D- Gaudu came across with a kilometer to go. Yates came, Landa, Valverde. Um, it was Rog and Pog that took it to the line. And it simply looked like Pogaccia knew the finish line better than Roglic. And he just maneuvered it better. And it took the final turns real smooth, kind of blocked Rog from having an opportunity to pass him. And literally now we're talking about the final 150, 100 meters. And... Pogacar took the win, and it's like, okay, you know, forget about what we saw in the time trial. Pog is just fine. Um, so took a nice win there over over Roglic. Now, you know, it's not gonna, it doesn't pull back enough time for him, unfortunately, um, which is the you know the consequence of of a time trial. But um, you know, it just we knew Pog was fine, so that was the main takeaway there. They put five seconds over Valverde, Yates, and Landa in that order. Gaudu just two seconds back from that from that, and then um, Knox. Vingago and uh, Van Sevenot came in 16 seconds back, and McNulty, who had the epic time trial, at 18 seconds. So after stage three, now we're starting to really see what the GC might look like. Uh, we got Roglic in the lead, Pogaccia 20 seconds back, McNulty 30 seconds back, Yates at 39, Valverde at 50, and Vingago at 54 seconds back, sitting in sixth. So stage four, this is where we really see the fireworks. Uh, we see a big shakeup. It was a fast and flying first hour. It kind of started on a downhill. There was no breakaway for over 100 kilometers, uh, but eventually one did get away. Let's get closer to the finish line now. We'll talk about 25 Ks to go. And we had a big group, and we saw attacks that started thinning it out. Esteban Chavez, who's been looking in good form. McNulty had the legs. Landa was there. Vingaga dragged uh, dragged back. And we basically had a 15-rider group at that point. And um, it was just kind of attack, attack, uh, from there on, you get to the final five kilometers, and there was really just six guys left, and uh, they had a minute over over the main bunch. So that group was Izagir, uh, Palo Bilbao, Brandon McNulty, Vingegaard. You know, I'm just gonna call him Vingegaard because it's easy. I can't do his proper pronunciations. Vingegaard, uh, Emmanuel Bookman, and Esteban Chavez, and it was that order in which they finished. It was actually a photo finish between Jan Izagir. And Bill Bow, and they actually kind of had it wrong. They 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 were looking at each other and they're like, oh no, you want it, no, you want it. Um, and then they actually had to go back and look at the tape. Um, so that was really cool. Um, but yeah, so they came in and they had 49 seconds ahead of the bunch. So that had big consequences because, as you've heard, McNulty with his epic time trial and his and his good form on stage three, and similarly, uh, Vingegaard and with his good time trial and. Uh, staying close only 18 seconds back on stage three changed the entire dynamic. So um, McNulty moved into the lead. Roglic moved to second, 23 seconds behind him. Vingegaard uh, moving into third. Um, Palo Bilbao to fourth. Pogaccia pushed back to fifth at 43 seconds. So most notably Roglic uh, for, for the overall race favorites, at least in terms of what we thought going in, Roglic with 20 seconds over Pogaccia. But kind of crazy it's like okay wait we got McNulty with 43 seconds over Pog so how's that going to work and Vingegaard just behind Roglic so how's that going to work out time would tell now stage five it didn't really have much of an impact on the overall but was fun to watch at the front we saw another bromance stage it took us back to stage 16 of the Tour de France last year we remember that scene after like the disastrous first half of the Tour de France and Egan Bernal dropping out and the team was like trying to pick up the pieces and Ineos had this awesome day out front. They had Catapaz and Cuiato, and they basically just dropped everybody. The stage uh, Hershey washed out on, and they came into the finale, and they had, like, I don't know, at least 30 seconds on everybody. They were, like, hugging and high-fiving and just the whole bromance show. And we saw a little bit of that uh, on stage five here. We had an absolute teeming masterclass by Decoyne Quickstep, who had uh, Mikael Honoré and Joseph Cherney off the front, clearing – they had a – a large attack group that was with them, and they eventually disposed of Julian Bernard, uh, who was the only one that was able to get to them in the final kilometers, uh, and really rolled into the finish. And they had like 20 seconds, and they were able to come in, and um, yeah, they did kind of like a fist pump coming in. And I was like, "Ooh, is that to say, hey, game on, let's just race race it in, or is that to say, hey, we figured it out? You know, we don't know what's coming on in race radio." 
Turns out uh, race radio was telling them, um, hey, it's on a raised day. That was the plan in the team bus this morning, so let's go with that. Make sure he crosses the line first. And I was curious what folks thought of that move. You know, do you do these like kind of, oh, it's all for the team. We're happy. High five. We'll roll in. Pretend we don't really care. But, you know, in their ears being told who, who's going to cross the line first or or not. Um, and you race it out. And look, a lot of folks wrote in and were like, hey, I like the, I like this approach. It's classy. Like they had a plan for the day. They, they worked in that regard. Um, just honor that rather than race. Look. I'll be honest, um, I was hoping for a little cheeky sprint because we want excitement. Yeah, it's like, I don't know. But uh, first World t- world Tour win for Honoré uh, would have been another for Cherney who won Stage 19 of the Giro last year. But I, I will say I do love the Master Class that gets put on when, when a team has two riders that drop everybody. It's It's got to feel pretty good. It looks good. So coming into today, the finale did a poll last night. It was chatting with Alejandro. I'm like, oh, well, what's going to go on today? And uh, I was like, I got to throw a poll up. So last night I threw a poll up. Will McNulty hold on or will it go to Slovenia? Now, I had a couple of people write in. They're like, well, your poll is confusing. Like, who are you talking about? Rog or Pog or both or whatever? Because the p- picture I posted with it was McNulty and Pogaccia. I was really thinking Roglic. I probably could have written that in. Um, but either way, could be both. Anyway, um, as of when coverage started, 45% of people said McNulty could do it. I think that's a little bit generous. Um, coming into today, my money would have been on Pog regardless because this is a challenging stage. I mean, six categorized climbs, three Cat 1s, and what we've seen is when you do these uh, like high vertical cl- uh, stages on relatively short parkour, like 120 kilometers or less, it's just so intense right from the jump. Like, they're just there's explosions into the first climbs. And that's exactly what we saw today. I mean, it was crazy. Um, so, so slight advantage to um, to Slovenia uh, in in the people's vote. But the way it played out, you know, it was kind of interesting. And and you know, again, we said it's like, okay, well, you got McNulty in the leader's jersey. He's got forty three seconds on Pog, but Pog is still twenty seconds behind Roglic, and then Roglic has a teammate between them. So, how do you play that hand? Um, and so, this is what happened. I mean. Roglic escaped into a choice break and broke apart the race with 60 to go um, to close on a on an escapee group that was out front. So th- they caught them. So we won't we won't dwell on that too much. So we had Roglic up ahead, um, and so UAE basically got caught out. So you've got Mark Hershey trying to pull them back with Pogaccia on his wheel, and he's still riding for McNulty. So McNulty's sitting on. Pogacar's wheel and it's like okay so they're trying to run this play for McNulty they're trying to get him to put on the funny Basque Country champion hat cool so for Jumbo Visma now Roglic is going to have to do a lot of the work himself up front now this all plays well for Mingegaard because he's able to sit and take a free ride from the work that UAE has to do to tie back to pull back Rog so Vingard had the easiest day of anybody because he's just like, well, I could sit because they're either going to try to track down Roglic or when they get him, UAE is going to have to attack because they're still behind um, on the standings unless McNulty was able to pull this whole thing through. So um, the group the group that Roglic was in was pretty committed because some of those guys wanted to keep a gap, maybe improve their overall position. We had Astana in there and Movistar. Movistar is always ready to work for whatever reason. They're, they always want to ride. Um, and when Hershey was done... Uh, Pog had to do all the work for McNulty. And now, you know, it's kind of weird to see because you're like, really? Um, like, it's just the two of you and you think you're going to pull this whole thing back and McNulty's going to have it in the finale? I don't know. It felt weird. But either way, it all worked itself out because with 45 kilometers to go, McNulty started cracking. Um, and so Pogaccia just, you know, he's on the radio and it's like, okay, he's just got to go for it. And so he's like, all right, I got to try to close this gap. I got to run up to this group. It was all on him. Nobody else is going to do it because nobody else in the GC uh, needs to, well, they just basically said, look, Pog's the one that's got to do all the work here. He's the one trying to win. They've got the leader's jersey. So if it's not McNulty, it's Pog. So Pog has to pull it back. So everyone was just happy to sit. So, So Pog goes for it. He's ready to try and go reel it back, but it's already come at such a big cost. He's already burnt matches for McNulty. That caused them to let a gap get even bigger because 
he wasn't able the pace he was pulling at wasn't even closing the gap and I mean it was kind of fun to watch like just the overall race start to unfold because you had the front group with Roglic and he's pulling his group forward and behind is Pogaccia doing the same thing just like pulling these two trains along and you know Rog Roglic thinned it out I mean by the time we got that pretty late um it was like him Gaudu and Hugh Carthy and but what was happening behind is Pogacar was pulling a huge, um, a huge team around, um, and by this time McNulty's off in no man's land. But the Pogacar group um, started getting big, and it was just like a bunch of dead looking souls. Um, Pog was getting really pissed that nobody worked. He was throwing his hands up, and there's just no interest. Um, and and he had some he had some big riders in there. I mean, you had Yates in there. You had Valverde. At some point, Valverde was like, "All right, like I'm bored too, so let me animate this thing a bit." And he took a couple turns out front and pulling off the front. They were like I don't know quasi attacks, but it wasn't cohesive at ever. And so Pogacar was trying to get everybody to to work. Nobody wanted to do it. Um, and uh, yeah, so. Now when they got to a point where it's like, okay, we're inside. Um, you know, when they were inside 20 kilometers and, and even sooner than that, the race dynamics then started to change, particularly up front, because remember, all that Roglic needs to do to win at this point with McNulty being dropped is get to the finish line within 20 seconds of Pogaccia, give or take, depending on if there's bonuses at play and all that. So he doesn't really need to win the stage. He just he just couldn't allow himself to get caught so early that there could potentially be a counterattack that dropped him. So as soon as they got to the point where he realized, like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good here, um, he no longer had to do the work. And it was like he could put eyes on Hugh Carthy and David Gaudu and say, okay, well, you guys work. Because, look, I, all I care about is the win. You guys, have, what do you got from this race? You got nothing. So you should probably do the work and maybe you could get out of here with a stage win. So co- dynamic completely changes in Hugh Carthy, but mostly David Gaudu start taking pulls out front. And at this point, you're like, okay, well, this race is sealed up unless – you know, Roglic has another disastrous, like, final day of Perry Nice where he's going to go crash three times. But, you know, knock on wood, that wasn't going to be the case, and it wasn't. So, uh, behind, while this, so, so while the fairy tale ending was, was unfolding up front, behind them, Pogaccio was, you know, maintained uh, his, fu- his fury um, and was just super frustrated. Uh, David Gaudu looked great. Hugh Carthy got a little lost in the sauce. He dropped back. And he was caught by the chase group and Valverde attacks from the front, Pog, Vingard on his wheel. And you get to the finish and we saw something that we've never seen, or I've, I've never seen. Um, it's it's Roglic and Gaudu. And they get to one kilometer and they do a fist pump, initiated seemingly by Roglic. And I'm like, oh, okay. So are they saying now game on again? This is, this is what I hope for. I always just want to see some carnage at the finish line, some just, like, hard, furious racing. But no, Roglic was actually conceding the stage to Gaudu. He's like, all right, you pull it in, and I'll get, you know, give you the stage. Now, I, that's not the exact words, but that was basically the, the agreement that they made on the stage. And look, you don't see too much of that anymore. And it was just a wild look um, when they came into the finishing shoot. You've got Gaudu out front there's a little descent to the over the crest um into the finish line so you're they're able to relax a little bit and you just see this gift from roglic handed over to gaudu and they're rolling into the finish roglic is like got his arms up cheering gaudu in front of him with his arms up cheering and somewhere back in the peloton gino mater is punching the sky after he wasn't given that gift back in Barry Nice. So, look, great win for Gaudu. Would he have won it really in a one-up sprint against Roglic here? Probably not, but good for him. And that's the way it unfolded. So uh, maybe uh, you know, Roglic is feeling like he's in a generous mood on his way to the podium. He said uh, that his girlfriend told him they were already uh, they were already drinking back at home. So um, good for them. You know, A bit later, the rest come in, Valverde winning the sprint to the line for third on the stage. Savage, just looking so good. And, you know, with him, Vingegaard, who got to sit all day thanks to Rog out front, and Jumbo Visma overall go first and second, Pogaccia third, Yates fourth. And for his efforts today, Gaudu finished fifth overall. So that was what went on at the front. Uh, just awesome day of racing there. 
and um, look, some not great results also in there. And you know, a couple, um, a, a, a couple to call out um, that I was just like, what, like, what's going on, guys? Um, I kind of want to pull it up, but like Higuita, who we've just seen so much from, um, did not look great overall um, in this race. Not even coming into uh, today, he was already a minute 45 back with no real result. Fool saying same thing. Enric Moss was way back and didn't didn't really feature. Coming into today, Fabio Aru, he was four minutes back. I didn't even know he was in the race. Rafael Mica, who they brought over to UAE from, from Bora to do a support job for Roglic. When they were 60K from the finish... 60k he was already gone and like that's exactly what who you need there to be protecting these guys way longer than he was able to and they really only had one horse left to go which was mark hershey who was able to go for about 15 kilometers and that was it so not sure what's going on there gam martin some weak attacks but way back um tau gegenhart what's happening there um and bulk malama who looked so good early in the season is just not doing much of consequence. So it's kind of wild. It's like we see, you know, this handful of guys that are, are consistently featuring and then some guys that were just not in the race this week. And so it's going to be interesting to see um, how that evolves for them. But I just had to call those guys out in particular because we've seen some real varying results, both from like the, the, the real opening weekend races. And when I say opening weekend, I'm, I'm not just meaning the cobbles, but like the Besege, the Provences, um, and then like, Terreno Adriatico and Perry Nice. And so, look, maybe it was just this race, um, but there's definitely some some cause for pause, a couple flags to look at. Um, so that was the Basque Country. It was awesome. Now, I need to talk quickly about um, Shell de Priest. The sprint classic, incredible race, one for the sprinters, exciting day because we had Mark Cavendish in there, with his, which, which, which was his first time riding with Sam Bennett and Michael Morku. And you're like, wow, in with the big guns. This is going to be great. You had a bunch of multi-time winners in there. Cavs won it three times. Um, It's a race where he he knows the terrain very well. And I was so pissed. I actually recorded an emergency pod on this. And, like, the audio came out so screwed up, I had to just abandon it. Um, So I'm going to just do this from memory. But what we need to call out, and, you know, we just we're oftentimes complimenting to coin a quick step on putting on a master class. And... They did the exact opposite of that at Shell Priest, and it cost them the stage. Uh, the way the race unfolded, to cut to it, you had two groups. You had a huge breakaway form with some of the favorite sprinters. Now, a couple guys got left out. Folks like Viviani and, and others got, got stuck back. But you had the Alpecin Phoenix squad. You had um, the Bora Hansgrove squad with Pascal Ackerman, and you had to coin a quick step. And... The way that Decoina Quickstep set up their sprint train was Morku, or, or well, I guess even before that, I think you had Seneschal, Morku, Bennett, and then Cav. So they were going to have Cavendish ride Bennett's wheel into the finish line. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, you know, we're so confident in, in the Bennett-Morku thing that that's totally fine to like scrap one of the rider, you know, basically not have to invest that resource up front. They're good enough as it is, and then whatever result Cav can get, great. But this is what happened. You get to the one kilometer sign, the Flamme Rouge, and you had Morku out front catching wind way too early. He's, he's on the front 400 meters, if not more, sooner than he should be. And you're cooked. So they're going down the left side. You got Morku, Bennett, Cavendish. And with like, I don't know, six or 800 to go, 600, the out of nowhere, basically, train of Alpecin Phoenix forms. And they've got Tim Merlier and um, Jasper Philipson. And so you think this is a day for Merlier, having won the sprints that he has, but don't sleep on. Jasper Philipson, uh, after winning some some stage uh, winning stage out in the Vuelta last year, and because Morku hit the front so early, he burnt out too soon, which meant Sam Bennett had to get up and launch his his attack way sooner than he should. 
out of position, the uh, Alpecin Phoenix train came across to them from the right to the left where the Dukoinik squad was, essentially blocking Sam Bennett, who lost position, hesitated, and then had to chase Alpecin Phoenix into the line. And Jasper Philipson took the win over Bennett and Cavendish in third. And they went 2-3. And now there's a storyline, I think it makes, you know, Cavendish the the most podiums at Shelter Priest of all time or something like that, you know, his first World Tour podium or, uh, you know, his first serious podium in a long time. It doesn't matter. Like, you're everyone would rather have a win than go 2-3. And you have to imagine, if they change that and they put Cavendish behind Seneschal in front of Morku and you save Morku for 400 more meters... Uh, and you really set up Bennett in position with 250 to go, you've got a completely different outcome of that race, and you've got Sam Bennett with his first title there. So it was just a rare mistake for DeKoinik to strategize in that way. Now, could they have gotten lucky and, you know, Alpeson didn't make that move, it didn't cause Sam Bennett to pause, they had a clear run in, could Sam Bennett still have won? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but they didn't, and they they didn't protect themselves against what did happen. So I just had to get that out because I was like a little frustrated with it. And um, so those are the races from this week. Now we look ahead, and tomorrow we're supposed to have the Tour of Turkey and the return of Fabio Jakobsen, which is just absolutely delightful to see. And it got canceled. Not the whole race, but the first stage because it's snowing covered in snow so no racing tomorrow they'll resume on monday hopefully with the race um it'll be fun to watch in particular because uh it's a feel-good story that Jakobsen's back on his bike he's still got a ways to go um with his face and teeth and he's got more work um to do there but he said he's like look i feel like a neo pro like i've been away for a while it's going to be a little scary um but i want to you know be be a bike racer again and it's kind of cool. They sent Hodge and uh, Cavendish there. And so any result is going to be a good one. Like it, any result for Cav or Jakobsen here, uh, people are just going to be delighted. Like even, even if Jakobsen just gets on a podium on a stage in a, in a, and contests a sprint, that'll feel great. And it'll be interesting to see how they deploy, um, deploy Cav. Look, the fact that Cav got third in Shelter Priest, that's a proper sprint. That was a really good sign. Like I know he got second in that other other stage, and you know, but it was like, it, like me and my friends out on a It just wasn't wasn't of the caliber that he had at Shelter Priest, which was real world tour sprint caliber riders. Um, is a really good sign. So hey, look, maybe maybe I'll be wrong in this whole thing, and Cav will sneak sneak a win in at some point this year. Um, but we'll see. But Tour of Turkey got eight days. Um, not sure how they're gonna redo it if they're just going to keep it reduced probably um with the canceled stage um but a good re- good return to racing for a couple of those guys and, and fun to see how they're putting these teams together so that was this week and if you're still listening and you haven't please subscribe just take a second to subscribe best way to support the show and let me know what your thoughts were shelter priest what happened there i i, I want to hear your opinions on it and then and then what about today like was it right for Pog to work for McNulty for that time? Is that the right tactic to take? Looked like Jumbo Visma did everything right. Did UAE? Um, love to hear everybody's thoughts on that. And until next time, thanks for listening to the Tour Breakaway.